First, let me ask you, if it was difficult uh, writing a biography without the help of the people that you were writing about? Um, you know, in a way it was and in a way it wasn't, because um, when you, there's something that happens when you get the collaboration or the cooperation of the people you're working with that sort of all of a sudden you're on their side. They take you into their confidence and you're all buddy-buddy and... And it's you almost you're almost like a recruit to the cause. Whereas if they give you absolutely no cooperation at all, then you know that you at least can maintain your objectivity. You know, you know it, what I mean? I I dig what you're saying, Lester. <laughs> Lester, is is this the first book you've written? Yeah. Uh, well, I wrote a novel in 1968 when I was in college, junior college, called Drug Punk, about being drinking Romilar cough syrup, but this is the first book I've written that's been published. Why did you decide to, to choose Blondie? Was, was, it, was it a vehicle that we, you were approached with? Uh, yeah, it was a vehicle I was approached with, and at the time I figured that it was a good way to talk about a lot of things I wanted to talk about, one of which was to tell the sort of story of the connection between the glitter era and the punk era uh, in New York, punk rock, whatever. I just the, the whole sort of like I saw that as like like history, you know, like like just sort of like like getting it down, getting the the facts straight. Like for instance, that say like that the Ramones did come before the Sex Pistols, you know, in spite of what everybody's been told, you know. And then second of all because in a lot of ways they epitomize a lot of this sort of Andy Warhol blank out um, uh, emotional, you know, anti-emotional, uh, arty kind of pop, nouveau pop art that has come about in the past few years. You know, the whole People magazine type thing that I'm always ranting and raving about. And um, also because I knew him, you know, and it was kind of like uh, writing, I mean, it was, you know, uh, you know, writing about people you know is better in a lot of ways than, um, you know, just right on. Oh, I'm starting to babble. I'd, I'd like to, this sort of brings me some questions about uh, a rock critic's uh, place in, in chronicling not just music, but it seems a growing part of pop culture. Let me start by asking how, how someone becomes a rock critic. I think everybody's a rock critic. I mean, in, to the extent that you go into a record store and you decide to buy this album over that one, you're being a rock critic. You know, and I mean, I don't have any more credentials than anybody else. Um, you know, like what I would say for myself is, is that everybody knows my prejudices, and I'm not God. I mean, just because I write something doesn't make it wrong or right. And I think that, you know, like that being a rock critic, you know, a lot of times the, the impetus for me and a lot of people I knew was just that we really loved rock and roll and, and wanted to talk about it, you know, and, and then there was this this outlet, and, and what kind of makes me mad is a lot of times today, it looks like a lot of the rock critics that are writing, you know, around in these magazines, it's like a good way to get a start in a career in journalism or something, you know, it's, it, it doesn't, it's not, you don't sense a real passion for the music. How, how, does, uh, how, how did you first get published, and how do most critics uh, begin by getting to get published? Well, I started in like 1968, 69, you know, and there was like, there actually used to be a little box in Rolling Stone, believe it or not, that said, do you write, take pictures, draw pictures, send your stuff to us, and maybe we'll publish it. So I actually believe this, and I started sending them record reviews, and I sent them like a pan of the second Grateful Dead album and a pan of the second Steve Miller album and a review that said White Light, White Heat was the best album in 1968, and Lou Reed was going to be the Chug Perry of the 70s, and it, rave about the marble index by nico and i couldn't figure out why they didn't print any of this stuff you know and then finally i sent in this review of the mc5 that i really hated their first album at the time and they liked that so they printed that and that was how i got started what about the contention many people have that rock critics are, are frustrated musicians do you find that true among people that you associate with in, in the uh, rock writing circle well, I'm not frustrated anymore because, uh, as everybody knows, I've gone ahead and made my own music. But I, I think, of course, they're frustrated musicians. Everybody's a frust. I think all rock fan, any all rock fans are frustrated musicians in the sense that anybody that ever stood in front of a mirror playing an invisible guitar while a record was spinning around playing behind them is a frustrated musician. You know. Now, some, you mentioned about the first things you did in the pans. 
there's also a contention that it's easier for a critic to, to write a bad review than a good review because he can pull out all the stops and make clever quips at the expense of, uh, of bands. Do you find this to be true, and do you find yourself sometimes tempted to head in that vein of a negative review just to sort of clear out your pores? No. Um, like, I always, even like Black Lives reviewing things like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, I always hope their next album would be really great because you always want something good to listen to, you know? You, you know, like, I hate everything right now. There's only about three or four groups I like currently, you know, that are actually existing. You know, it's, it's like you always, I, I want everything to be really great so I'll have something to play, you know? And, and like, I don't, you know, like, I don't sit down and, and, and think, well, let's see, who can I find to pick on today? You know, um, besides which, I mean, it's like, uh, I think people with critics, it's, it's like, like, critics are sort of the people you love to hate anyway, you know? For, does that ever bother you? Do you find yourself sort of in the center of controversy ever, or that bands maybe uh, take a negative view of you just because you're a rock critic? Um... Well, I just, I generally find that, you know, if I am ever, like, put in a weirdo position, it's usually by some wretched worm, you know, it's like never anybody that I have any respect for that has any intelligence or any kind of anything going for them, it's usually the worms and the miserable, you know, you know, wretches of the world, because there's something about me that I, like, sort of, like, I don't know, it's like, like, I'm not snotty with people, you know, like, I, like, I never wrote anything that I thought, well, I wrote one thing, actually, that I thought was, was wrong, which was that description of Rachel, Lou Reed's old companion in Cream. You know, She's a sweet girl, or man, or whatever. Yeah, right, I, I thought that, that was really vicious and uncalled for, and I, and I re still regret that. But other than that, I don't think I ever, you know, wrote anything about anybody that they didn't have an enormous hype, a bunch of ego, and a bunch of other crap behind them. And, uh, you know, like in general, I don't treat people snotty. I don't go out of my way to pick on groups that are like, uh, you know, like little, you know, just starting out or getting trying to get a foothold or whatever. And um, as far as people attacking me personally... You know, like, there's been, like, a lot of reviews that have said that I couldn't sing or that I had no business in music or stuff like that, and I welcome those, you know. Like, like I, I think that, see, what I think is that anybody that gets up on a stage or makes a record is saying, I'm something special, and they, therefore they should be able to take anything that comes through the door, you know. So I'm not going to whine about, you know, any kind of negative reviews or anything of that of my own musical endeavors, you know, like... Because I think that it's just like you, you, you know, like you, it's it's an open marketplace and of ideas and and I mean, there's even been like one review of the Blondie book that NME didn't like it, which I expected coming because all those limeys hate us all because they think we're decadent Americans anyway, you know. But um, you know, that's that guy's right to say that, and it's somebody, it's my right to hate a record or this or that, and it's somebody else's right even to take cheap shots, you know, like. Like somebody in the in the East Village Eye reviewed my single, and, and it was a really moronic review that said like, you know, it's just all it said was like like, well, this the music stinks, the 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 singing stinks, the lyrics stink, and that was about the extent of the review. It didn't go into any really deep analysis or anything. And, you know, all right, fine. I mean, that's that guy's right to do that too. You know? In terms of your own fans that you have uh, pronounced on others, have you ever seen anybody afterwards who's uh, perhaps? said to you, well, those, those points you pointed out were very valid, and I'm glad you brought them to my attention, or it may be, if not so, self-prostrating other comments that uh, let you know that perhaps some of your, your negative points of view had been uh, taken to heart? Yeah, and like, what I can specifically remember was one case, which I can't name who it was, for a reason that will shortly become obvious, which is that I reviewed an album last year by like an artist who is one of the most beloved around the New York scene and all that and you know and uh, and I really tore it to shreds and uh, a person who was a friend of that artist and a real well-known writer called me up the night the review appeared and said listen you know like I know you're going to get a lot of flack for this but it's true and everything that you know uh, everybody that you know all his friends have known it for you know a long time and nobody had the heart to say it so in the long run you're doing him a favor you know but you can I, tell me who it was well, all right, yeah, it was David Johansson. I just don't want to oh, say who the other person was. I thought maybe was. it was Tom Verlaine or something. Yeah, I wouldn't do Tom Verlaine. I wouldn't do Tom Verlaine any favors. 
Uh, well, you started in 1968, and uh, it certainly rock journalism and criticism has come away from them. But do you think it is, uh, would you put, if you might use the term, in danger of becoming considered valid journalism, or do you think it is getting too tainted by respectability, sort of the same type of respectability that perhaps uh, people like the Sex Pistols protested about of rock uh, musicians themselves? Do you think a counter sort of thing could be happening with uh, rock journalism becoming uh, too staid and accepted? I think it barely exists anymore, but then neither does the music, you know? I mean, it's like everybody's acting like there's this big renaissance going on, and it's all, you know, it's the emperor's new clothes. I mean, there's a few groups that are doing really, you know, exciting things, and then there's like all these phony power pop groups on one side and all these phony synthesizer groups on the other, and I think it's a big hype. I think it's a lot of garbage, and I think that the critics, you know, are writing up and saying all these people like the Pretenders and Lena Lovitch and all this stuff is like really about something or means anything or stands for anything or, or is worth anything only because to give themselves something to write about because otherwise they'd be stuck, you know, because like it's, I mean, like, it's not like in, like, 1977 when you had, like, you know, like The Clash and Richard Hell and the Voidoids and, you know, and the Sex Pistols and all these groups and the Ramones, and they all stood for something. They were about something, talking heads, you know, like, they all, like, had a real point of view about the world, and they really, you know, really meant something. And, and these groups now, they're all just interchangeable. They're just singing, like, you know, piddly little love songs that, you know, don't even matter. You know, I mean, so what if a girl, you know, tells a guy to blow off, you know, big deal. You know, I mean, you know, Leslie Gore did it, you know, years and years ago. So what, you know? Let's well, artistic point aside. What about the economic viability of the rock criticism profession? Is there economic viability in it? Very little, you know. I mean, I wouldn't advise anybody to go into it if they wanted to get rich. But I wouldn't advise anybody to be a writer or a musician if they wanted to get rich. Hell, I've known a lot of musicians and bands that had top ten albums that didn't have a dime in their pockets, you know. I mean, but as far as, as record reviews and that, I mean, it doesn't pay that well. And it's like, I don't know. I mean, there, there's people, you, you could, you know, if you were worm your way into the heart of Rolling Stone and you can get all this money for writing that, you know, so-and-so. I mean, that's one thing I tried to get away in the, from in the Blondie book. is like, you know, you read his article and say, her heart-stoppingly gorgeous face, you know. I mean, if you want to write tap like that, like, you know, you know, I mean, of course, you could also go to work for the PR agency of a record company or something, you know. What are your feelings about the influence that, that, uh, that critics wield? Do you ever wonder, first of all, it, the uh, medium itself is, is based on music and listening, and here uh, rock critics introduce the writing medium, which, given the average rock fan's uh, mentality, perhaps isn't too good a start to begin with. Do you, what are your feelings uh, about the impact that rock critics have on music? Do you f ever wonder whether you're beating your head into the typewriter, etc.? No. I mean, for, for one thing, well, I mean, look what you just said, the average rock fan's mentality. I mean, what do you think, they're all morons or something? Many. I mean, like, okay, well, I edited Cream Magazine for five years, and we had, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of readers who, like, really dug it that we were telling Dylan and the Stones and all these people to go jump in the lake, you know, and, you know, that we, you know, like, whatever, you know, like, they, they, weren't, they weren't idiots that just swallowed any hype that was shoveled to them, you know, and so I, I really, like, I hate that, that everybody thinks that, that, that fans are just, just morons, it'll just swallow any garbage, you know, I mean, like, like, because I think the kids are really sharp, you know, like, I talked to, like, like, this 13-year-old called me up the other day that wants to write a book about Blondie that, you know, just like, like, uh, it was right on top of it, you know, it's, you know, like, like, you know, it was, was so, the same criticism. What? So do you think that, that critics can be really, uh, uh, sort of useful purpose of maybe being sort of a lightning rod to, to show, if not always to express new opinions, at least to let other people know that there are others that uh, are thinking along similar lines, etc. Yeah, that's it, exactly, because it's like, okay, like, let's say a new Bob Dylan album comes out, right, and there's all this hype. Well, I'll give you an example. Hard Rain, when that thing came out, like, like I was sent the album in the mail, I reviewed it, I panned it, I panned the TV show based around it, you know, the whole thing, and then I sold the record, and then, like, then they started showing these commercials for it on TV, and they showed it every station break on the Late Show. And, like, you know, again and again, you see me, ah, Maggie, you know, and, like, I, it went, you know, like, by the time I'd seen this commercial about 900,000 times, I was ready to go out and buy the damn album over again myself. 
you know, and I don't, I, you know what I mean? And so, like, like, I think that, you know, in, in the sense that if you, you know, like, when you get that much hype batter at you and, and you're told this is hip or that's cool or something, it's just like, I mean, I'm not setting myself up as any great god or arbiter or judge or anything, except for me. You know, and, and like I said at the beginning, like everybody knows what my prejudices are. I, I like, you know, certain, I mean, some of the things I like are very unpopular, and some of the other things I like are more popular, but just that people can, like, you know, if, if like, if, if they're reading myself, they can say, well, you know, maybe, you know, if I suspect, let's say if I, the listener, right, the record buyer out there, suspect that the new Dylan album, say, is a hype and is not the great masterpiece it's cracked up to be by the record company and all the bought off people at all the places like Circus and Rolling Stone and all of that, then, you know, you know, maybe I won't buy it. <laughs> you know what I mean? About these bought off people, so do you feel that a lot of rock criticism is more a pocketbook sort of motivated and, uh, no, it, you don't understand what I mean. I don't mean that they're they're given direct payola. What I mean is is that it's not even it's more insidious than that. I mean I mean that in this country today it is you know like in Britain they have a tradition of all, of adversary journalism. It's expected if you put out a record the critics are going to lambaste it or the writers you know the the press is going to kill you. Here in terms of rock and and popular music and the entertainment industry in this country in the in the late seventies and the early eighties it is routinely expected that. That if any artist gives an interview to any writer, you know, that they're automatically going to get a favorable story, and I think that's obscene. And they also ask for things, as Blondie did with this book, like, you know, right of approval of a story or a book on them. And I told Chris Stein, I said, I would never give that to anybody because that amounts to an authorized biography, which is nothing but a puff job in the first place. You know, and I think nobody should ever, no artist should ever ask for right of approval from any writer for any story. You know, and I've heard all kinds of stories like, you know, Chet Flippo got thrown off the Rolling Stones tour when he was covering it because Paul Nelson had the temerity to pan some girls in the pages of Rolling Stone magazine when Chet Flippo was covering the tour for the same magazine, you know. And I saw the same thing happen in England with Stiff Records when I was over there. Like some writer, you know, like panned the Stiff's Greatest Hits tour and then asked for damn tickets. And they said, can you believe the nerve of this guy? And I said, well, good. give him the tickets. You know, of course he should have the tickets. Maybe so. What if he hates every other act on your label but the Damned? You know, if he likes the Damned, or if he, even if he doesn't give, you know, like well, it's his right as a critic, is, is you know, to do that. And and it really, really angers me that you know, and everybody goes along with it. That's what really kills me. Is that you know, like, well, what can you do? You know, and all the magazines go along with it, and they just print all this pap, all this, you know, they might as well just be writing press releases. What feedback have you gotten, if any, uh, from Blondie and member, members of the band about uh, about the biography? Well, after making it incredibly hard for me to do it, they told me that they liked it, and, and I've since the book has come out, I've been over to Chris and Debbie's apartment, you know, and interviewed Chris for my next book, and uh, you know, I guess you know, you know, relations are friendly. I don't know. And what about the future of, of rock criticism? Do you see yourself at all maybe moving into other modes? Do you see that maybe the, you'll get involved in other kinds of journalism as well that maybe are pop culture oriented but not as directly about music? Yeah. Yeah, I want to write a book about sex. And in fact, I'm already working on it. It's about like relationships and men and women and sex. And like, that's like, you know, and... I have other interests too, you know. Like, like I like, like I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. I'd like to write a book about that. Um, there's a whole lot of things I'd like to do, you know. What do you find being the toughest part of uh, being a rock critic? Well, you finally asked me a question. I can't think of an immediate answer to the toughest part of being a rock critic. I don't know. I mean, let's face it. I've got it easy. I, I mean, nobody knows it better than I do. You know, the, uh, all right, I'll tell you, like, what bothers me the most is that I never know if anybody is being straight with me, because, like, like say, like, okay, about my record, you know, like, people say, oh, I love your record, you know, I don't know if they actually mean that, because, you know, like, everybody wants you, if you're a rock critic, to say that their, you know, band is good or something like that. You know, except now what you have on the alternative is that everybody, they know that they've picked up the cue from the English to supposed to be snotty, so they cop this pose of being, you know, like, like, oh, who needs you? And, like, basically the toughest part is, like, running into people who do, who react in ways that they think they're supposed to, you know, 
Yeah, whether they're trying to imp- uh, either way, they're trying to impress you. They're trying to impress you with how much they like you, or they, or, or then uh, what great people they are, or they're trying to impress you with how much they don't care. But either way, it's phony, you know. And like that, basically, I'd say is is for me anyway, you know, the thing that bugs me the most. How has the book been selling? Oh, real good. It's doing great. Uh, do you have any opportunities to have you, or do you expect to, like, being on Merv or dying and discussing the entire uh, rock scene and whatnot? Well, I told him I wanted to be on Joe Franklin, you know, like, uh, nothing's happened yet, but uh, basically it's been radio. <laughs> and do you find yourself at all uh, changing as you become perhaps more of a media personality than less of just a, a rock critic? I don't want to be a media personality, you know. I mean, it may seem like a contradiction in terms since I'm doing this interview with you right now, but I just want to be a good writer, you know. And and to the extent that I can, you know, like sort of in a way even keep a low profile and do that, I'll be happy. I mean, like, like I don't want my picture in, in you know, People magazine or even New York Rocker. You know, and all that as, as, as some guy that's on the scene doing all this garbage. You know, I don't care about any of that stuff. I just go ahead and do what I do, you know, and, and, and like, I just, I think this whole thing of being a celebrity and a media personality, it like, it, you know, in, in so many cases, it so much tends to eclipse whatever the person might want to do artistically, you know, like creatively, that the other just about disappears. And I think that's the big trap. You know, and I don't, you know, like, you know, what, you know, everybody's any, everybody's a media personality now, you know, I mean, like, I'll, you know what I mean? Like, like, I'll, all right, I wrote a book. Like Andy said, everybody's famous for 15 minutes. Yeah, well, I just think it's a shame old Valerie missed. Uh, one last question, Lester. People that want to get into rock writing, rock criticism, youngsters out there, maybe even people ready to give up their present career for another one, what would you, what advice would you be, uh, have for them, uh, if it wasn't to, to not get into rock criticism, how would you advise them to get, uh, to go about it? I actually don't know because I'm so utterly alienated myself and utterly disgusted, to be quite frank, that I wonder you know, if I really want to do anything in the next few years. See, you know, the thing is, is that everything is turning into People magazine. I mean, like, all the radio, all the press, all everything is turning into this, you know, even the book industry. I was talking to my agent yesterday, and I said to him, I said, um, do you think it's going to reach the point where the only thing you can sell is a celebrity biography that's just a puff job? And he said, I don't know. You know, so I don't know, you know, like, like, I want. I sit around and wonder, like, if maybe the best thing I could do for myself as a writer wouldn't be just to completely get away from all this stuff, you know. And if somebody, like, you know, like somebody young that wants to write, like I, it used to be, like, I could have, it, you know, in the past, advised them a lot clearer, you know, if they wanted it about, like, and that haunted me, you know. And I don't. I'm not gonna saw away at my violin here and try and break everybody's heart because, like I said, I know I've got it easy, you know. Like, like, like. It's, you know, I don't, the fact is, I don't have to get up in the morning and go work from 9 to 5 in a factory or something, you know, and, and I do have access, and I do have, you know, a lot of things that, you know, I mean, that nobody should feel sorry for me, you know, but at the same time, um, everybody I know is just totally alienated and just, and fed up and disgusted with just about everything and I do know that most of the people in the media that are dispensing this stuff you know are as alienated from it as the audience is and uh, you know the audience is just taking it because there's nothing else being offered and personally I'm just wondering when people are going to just say no I refuse I don't want any anymore Lester I don't have any more questions is there anything I haven't asked you about about your book or your career or your writing in general that uh, you want to bring up no, I probably ranted and raved on my high horse way past any of those points anyway. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for taking the time, and uh, good luck with with uh, with your writing and your single and whatnot, and I'm sure I'll be seeing you around soon. Okay, great. There's just one thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, could I ask you, like, what this is going on? Yeah, this w- Give me your address there. Yeah, it's 542 6th Avenue. 542 6th Avenue. Uh-huh. Okay, New York City, and what's the zip? Uh, 10011. Okay. Apartment number is 5F. Okay, great. 
This is only going to be three to five minutes out of all this talk? That's right. Well, that's right. Well, that's good. You weed out a lot of it. Because, like, I'm sitting here, you know, in a sweat box, and I probably blabbered on. We're going to get right to the point really with it. But, you know, that's it, generally we, we do long interviews.